Once again, welcome to the University of Illinois Research Park at the University of Illinois and Enterprise Works Incubator. We're happy to have you join us today for a discussion about companies that are local to our community and that have come from the incubator that have been able to pivot their expertise in technology from areas of industry focus that had wide applications or maybe targeted, but they saw an opportunity to respond to COVID-19 and the medical needs of our country. And they'll be sharing some of those um, opportunities and challenges that they faced. Our discussion today will include three entrepreneurs and it's going to be moderated by Laura Blyle, our Director of External Engagements. But thank you to our entrepreneurs that are joining us. We really appreciate you sharing your candid um, experiences. A little bit of the, the good stuff and a little bit of the bad might be incorporated in today's comments, but we couldn't be prouder at the University of Illinois of the ingenuity and innovation of researchers across the campus and those of you that are entrepreneurs who are helping to bridge those opportunities into commercialization and to pursue federal funding and partnerships that will get them to the market. So thanks for joining us. I'll hand it over to Laura Blyle. Thanks, Laura. Uh, we are, again, thrilled to have um, three folks who we work with or have worked with for many years um, and have watched this journey over the past few months, but really wanted to hear from them directly to learn more about um, some of the uh, experiences that they've had sort of pivoting technology or pivoting might not be exactly the right word. We'll hear from them in their own words as to what that has looked like, but applying technology to uh, different areas that are related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm just going to give a few um, quick introductions and then we have a bunch of questions that we want to ask our panelists. Um, and we will then also have time for question and answers from our participants. So thanks to all for being here. I'm looking at uh, Jim Langer first. So uh, Jim Langer is a uh, PhD alum of the University of Illinois in material science and engineering. He co-founded Serionics in 2011 to commercialize high performance filtration materials for removal of toxic chemicals from air and water. Within two years of starting the company, he successfully directed early business and technical development of Serionics, resulting in public and private funding in excess of $3 million. Uh, Serionics is a, we are proud that Serionics is a graduate of the Enterprise Works Incubator at the Research Park and continues operations in Urbana. So, welcome, Jim. Thanks, Laura. Um, okay, I, Mike, if you don't mind turning on your video, I'm going to come back to you, but uh, I, oh, there you are. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess uh, since I picked on you, I should go ahead and introduce you. So Mike <laughs> Hansen. <laughs> Mike Hansen is the design lead at EarthSense, which is a current Enterprise Works incubator tenant and has been with the company for almost two years. Um, he has both of his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in industrial design. And we didn't necessarily make it so that you all had a U of I very close tie, but it's always nice to have that. So, um, and we love our alums. So before journey, joining EarthSense, Mike worked in the nuclear industry designing safety equipment and later did research in the medical healthcare industry on introducing new products into the healthcare environment. He is a designer that specializes in prototype development and the scalability of product manufacturing. And some of you, if you've been in the incubator, may have been on tours with us where you've seen Mike tinkering with robots um, live and in person. So uh, we miss that. Um, so thanks for being here, Mike. And then I'm going to pivot over to uh, to Bob Coverdell. So um, Bob Coverdell is a uh, retired from the University of Illinois, has a background in mechanical engineering, and more significantly, perhaps for, for his current role, is a very long tenured pilot. He is the uh, chief operating officer of Air Scout and the founder and, pre and president of Ag Air Imaging. Um, and we get to, again, another, another person who we get to see in our midst 
um, when we are there daily. So thank you to Bob for being with us and we look forward to hearing about infrared imaging and how that has played a role um, in this in this time. So welcome to you all. Um, I do have some questions. I don't know if you guys wanted to add anything to the introductions before I move into my first question. Nope. I think I'm good, Laura. All right. Um, so I guess I, I alluded to it a little bit, but um, I'll, I, I have no, in pr no particular order. I wanted to have you all describe your current, your technologies and what your companies and operations look like before the pandemic. So that gives us a baseline to understand um, how, what has happened the last few months. So um, maybe Bob, if you wanna go first. Sure, be happy to, nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So Air Scout is an aerial imaging company where we predominantly take pictures of farm fields throughout the Midwest. We have a proprietary sensor pack that we put in our own airplanes and hire our own pilots. And it's done on a subscription basis starting in April through September. And, and we deliver roughly on an average 10, every 10 days imagery with analysis to, uh, to farmers. We've started pivoting out to some other types of work. So I just came back from a long flight where we did an aerial pipeline survey out to Montana. We're working with U of I researchers on some uh, more advanced types of sensors and airplanes and partnering with them and, and doing other custom work as well. Um, our, our company model is we're, we're pretty distributed. You know, we've got people in several different states. Enterprise Works is our home, but you know, we work pretty effectively you know, over virtual sort of interactions. We've got eight airplanes in four different hangars in central Illinois. And operations are, are heavily seasonal, I would say. You know, we really get busy in April and we wrap up the heavy part of the flying in September. So this, this pandemic hit right when we were ready to step up to the plate and start swinging. And, and um, that's, that's basically what our core business is. You know, the ag air imaging part that Laura mentioned is the airplane part of the business and Air Scout is the software part of the business. Great, thanks. Mike? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I'm the design leader at EarthSense, and we're a agricultural data collecting um, service as well. So kind of like what Robert was saying, he's up in the sky and we're down in the dirt. So we create uh, little wheeled robots that uh, go through all sorts of different um, you know, types of crops to collect data. Um, we're doing three-dimensional scanning as well as um, video to be able to kind of analyze how well crops are doing, you know, some of the dates and things like that are going through it. So um, Again, yeah, we've got robots um, actually just shipped out a batch of them a couple weeks ago. So that was a huge thing. We've got more going out. Um, so kind of like Robert was saying too, we got hit, you know, right as a time when we're like really ramping things up for the uh, you know, spring season to kick off where we're trying to build, test and do all of that stuff while, you know, social distancing. So that was quite a bit of a challenge for us. Um, luckily, a lot of our stuff is digital, um, you know, outside of the manufacturing. So that wasn't a huge impact. We you know, already had, you know, um, computer engineers that would, you know, work from, you know, midnight to 6 a.m. kind of thing. So, you know, our, a big chunk of our, you know, our workforce did not uh, really get impacted much onto it. But um, the prototyping and, um, you know, physical, you know, manufacturing part was, a, was hit pretty hard and it was a big challenge for us to kind of adjust to that. Thanks. Jim, you want to tell us about Syrianix and what things look like pre-mid-March? Yeah, so we're, I appreciate the, you know, introduction earlier and appreciate the opportunity to chat here. Uh, so we are focused on uh, air purification and, you know, uh, we are uh, very familiar with pivots, I guess, uh, from the very beginning of the company, we've taken plenty, but uh, we have built a uh, air filter, a smart air filter that removes toxic chemicals and odors from the air that changes color to let you know when it's working and when it's expired. And through a long journey of technology development and working with NASA and other really high-end customers, uh, we actually pivoted into direct-to-consumer marketing last year. And we launched uh, in earnest late, uh, late last year and had a steady growth in our first commercial product, which is a residential HVAC filter. Uh, and so things were kind of you know, ramping up. And just as I said, with the you know, agriculture, it, it really you know, picks up in, in April, you know, for us, it was more just a, a matter of our, 
you know, company life cycle that we were in the midst of a pretty significant growth trajectory right when, you know, COVID struck. Right. So just going back to you, Jim, kind of following on with that. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how COVID, how initially the situation impacted the business? You just alluded to it. And then perhaps sort of talking, kind of going into our topic today is how did you determine that your technology might be applied to a COVID-19 related uh, need? Sure. Yeah, so when COVID, you know, kind of like the week before everything really, you know, ramped up, I think it was the second week of, of March, uh, we saw demand start skyrocketing. And I don't, I think that it was, it was across the board, just purchasing skyrocketed as a lot of people started anticipating maybe, you know, hoarding behavior. And all of a sudden it was just kind of out of nowhere, our ads were producing, you know, 2x the ROI they had been prior to that. And we knew something, something was up. And as the demand increased, uh, we had, you know, we kind of started preparing for how we were going to accommodate that growth in our operation and demand and fulfillment. Uh, because we're doing, though we use external, um, so we have an external supply chain, we handle all of the fulfillment uh, out of our facility over in Urbana. And so we had to kind of prepare for scale, you know, scaling that up. And then when the stay at home order uh, hit, uh, we, you know, it was, it was crazy because it was a confluence of significant demand at the same time that we were uh, trying to navigate what that meant for us. And so we deemed our work, you know, essential given uh, that our product is, you know, is a, a health and wellness product that's, you know, an essential home good. And we basically operated on a skeleton crew, but it was a, that was an interesting experience in navigating hiring, um, you know, while, you know, demand was, you know, increasing, basically increased about tenfold um, and sales, you know, really skyrocketed. And so, you know, for the most part, it was pretty, uh, it was, you know, those were all kind of, you know, like interesting challenges, but things we were able to navigate. And we were mostly immune. We have a, a, a nearly fully domestic supply chain and we were mostly immune from a lot of the supply chain issues that others were having. And the filtration industry in general has benefited, you know, in some respects from increased demand, but the, uh, you know, eventually what's happened since then is that the, um, you know, while we were initially immune, kind of things eventually caught up to us in terms of a lot of the, the industry that's, that's repurposed their lines in order to make face masks has created a lot of really weird, you know, uh, supply chain dynamics and pricing and uh, lead times. And so it's kind of caught up to us now and we're going to have to work through a little bit of a pinch there. Uh, but in terms of our response to it, we had already identified when we were looking at our go-to-market plan a couple of years ago, we had already identified face masks as a, uh, a product where our technology you know, could have a good fit, where the, the core value proposition is um, that, the, that not only just the performance of the product, which is you know, for removing toxic chemicals and odors, and as it happens, is highly antiviral, uh, but then it changes color to let you know when it's working and when it's expired. So there's like a really, uh, powerful, um, uh, intuitive dynamic with the product there. And we had had it tested against other, you know, viruses and bacteria, and it was, you know, the material proved really effective against them a couple years ago. And so it was really kind of digging that product development um, out, you know, taking it off of the back burner and putting it in the forefront. And so the journey, you know, since then has been, you know, has been a very interesting one. Um, the initial data that we had suggested a really good fit, and so um, we were we were able to you know get pretty scrappy and work with uh, work with as an example one of our uh, partners at at NASA or I guess not a partner but contracting officer at NASA who decided just to volunteer his time he and his wife to start making face masks that then they could use our our filter in in it and so. I don't want to give away the end of the story, but you know that was kind of you know we we had seen the fit because of previous work we had done, and so it was pretty natural given the pressure on the 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 uh, face mask supply chain to say hey we have something that could really make a difference here let's pivot and you know see what we can do here and kind of explore all the you know avenues available to us there. 
Great. Um, Mike, do you want to address that? How, how did, I, I think that your background potentially in healthcare is a germane to this discussion. And uh, so how, how did EarthSense go about um, working through that process to determine if there's an application? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, so the fact that I've done healthcare research and then also working at, um, and at uh, EarthSense was a complete coincidence. Um, so lucky for me that my you know, some of my background actually very much helped us out. Um, so I guess yeah, one of the big things for us was that um, we were already kind of developing the tech that was needed. So um, we're developing um, in conjunction with uh, Chris Hauser that's in the computer science and computer engineering department to develop a UV robotic arm that can uh, kind of comb through hospitals or environments to um, basically um, sanitize things. And one of the nice things was is as you know earth sense is you know working to ramp up what we're able you know capable of doing um some of the needs in order to be able to do that function of that uv light of being able to navigate complex environments um, safely and well you know something that we were already working on with earth sense we just kind of had to transfer over the you know environment we're doing but we already had the infrastructure infrastructure of keeping um you know machine learning to teach you about the environments um and as well as just the robotics part of it of transporting was you know right up our alley and then one of the other problems of being able to kind of manipulate that you know uv light and move things around um is just basically a robotic arm and we were already working with um Bruce krishnam um to develop a robotic arm that can harvest um you know plants so it's kind of this tech where we needed to navigate we needed to move you know manipulate something around we already had that tech you know that we're working on and developing um, and then in conjunction with Chris Hauser, I wish I knew exactly how that connection was made um, between our co-founders, Jimmy and Grish, uh, but they kind of connected and through that, um, we were able to kind of combine all of our skills where they're very heavy and they have a team doing the UV lights and as well as the you know, machine learning for things for the navigation. Mm -hmm. So um, it was kind of one of those things where we had earth sense, but like we want to do something. Um, our founders are, you know, very, very passionate about getting involved in those types of things. So. Uh, we were pretty quick to, you know, reach out to get some funding and get involved and, um, you know, do that. And we were, you know, kind of figuring things out as we went with it. Um, but it was nice that we we have a team that, you know, is able to, you know, design a whole robot, um, you know, design it, test it, produce it, and then ship it within about a nine-month period, which is a huge testament to the, to the group I work with on that. So um, we're actually really ramping that project up now, and uh, I'm currently designing some parts for it, and we're building prototypes already on that. So it's... Uh, yeah. It, it worked out really well with us and you know we're really happy to be involved in such a great project. So I think we can attribute that to the the magic collaborative spirit across the University of Illinois that exists amongst our, our faculty and researchers. So we'll get to the more in depth about prototyping and funding in a second. I do want to turn it over to Bob and, and, and pose you the same question. So tell us a little bit about the uh, application of the um, the, the imaging related, the imaging technology that Air Scout uses in farm fields and how that has a COVID-19 related application. And yeah, it seems like that's a, a real stretch, but ironically it, it's not. You know, the, the company that we purchase our uh, highly sensitive thermal cameras from is a small thermal camera company in Texas. And they've been selling them for medical applications for, for quite some time. And, and as you were commenting about the filtration demand suddenly skyrocketing, they were just getting blown up with people wanting to buy cameras all of a sudden. And they reached out to us to see if we'd be interested in, in putting the packages together up here in the Midwest, you know, sort of represent them, if you will, um, because we've got a lot of experience with these thermal cameras. So the gist of it is, is the same thermal camera we use in the airplane, which is about a $10,000 camera, can be mounted on a small tripod or a stand and with software they've written, in a laptop, um, you can stand in front of it in about one second, it'll tell you what your body temperature is. And it's uh, meets all the, the, the U, you know, what would be the FDA approvals, you know, it's the only system out there that's really fully calibrated. And what makes it kind of cool is that, you know, if you know anything about thermal measurements, you need to have some sort of a reference box to, to get an accurate temperature. And, and they sell a, what they call a black body, which is a thermal black body. And you mount that in the background and, and uh, you literally can set this up at the entrance to your building or your company or wherever and people can walk in and it literally doesn't slow them down at all in one second and you either got a green light or a red light, your temperature's within limits and you move on. 
So we're, we're starting to develop a plan. Unfortunately, just don't have enough bandwidth to do it as quickly as I'd like to, to, to talk to companies locally, Champaign County area to see if there's interest in this. You know, we, we know that temperature is not the only indicator of perhaps either COVID or some other viral infection, but it is an indicator. You know, if, if you can detect people coming to work with fever, it's probably a, a good filter, you know, a different sort of filter than Ceronics filter is, but, you know, a filter nonetheless to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe maybe you shouldn't be coming in here today. And, and, and my thought is that, especially as we get in the university environment where we know there's lots of young people working and, you know, may not necessarily realize when they're running a 99.5 fever, they just don't think they feel great maybe from being at CAMS last night and they come to work. It could, could help us with, catching some early cases. It could simply be influenza. It doesn't necessarily mean COVID. It could promote healthier workplaces. So we've got five of these systems right now deployed in a huge YMCA complex in Northwest Indiana. It's going really well. Um, we're putting a model together where they'd be available either for purchase or lease and you know we would do the technical staffing of them. But again, you know, we're, we're still right in the midst of our farm season. So everybody's stretched pretty thin and I'm trying to figure out how to pull all this together at the same time. But um, Hopefully in the next week or two, I'll, I'll have a plan I can share. But it's it's kind of an interesting pivot, one that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of in February, but it sure makes a lot of sense now that I think about it. So I am, a couple of you have alluded to this. I guess, Jim, you kind of already uh, teased this, but what kinds of resources or partnerships did you seek out um, to achieve this you know, the, this pivot for a lack of a better term, um, with your filters, you know, you mentioned the NASA program officer, but also wanted to address resources or partnerships could include, you know, also funding and prototyping as well. So if you want to just elaborate on sort of what you said earlier. Yeah. So, um, we, we took advantage of everything that, that we could. And, you know, I think initially we just saw it as an opportunity, um, where we were just going to do whatever we could. You know, we knew something, it would be better than people wearing a bandana um, and, you know, better protection than, than that and, and without having to uh, take, you know, the higher quality masks away from, you know, the, the front lines and health healthcare providers. And in terms of, you know, getting that out, even just on a volunteer basis or a donation basis, we had collaborated with, you um, with yeah, our, our contracting officer and his wife who basically <clears throat> prototyped and started making masks out of their home. And I think they ended up working with uh, friends at a Buddhist temple nearby that had just started <laughs> sewing masks. And, you know, so we supplied material for free and then, you know, there was really no, um, there, there wasn't a lot of liability associated with that because we weren't really making any claims. We were just giving stuff to a friend for him to, um, to use. And, you know, simultaneously, we were looking at what the bigger opportunity might be for the company as COVID stretches out. And as we look to the future of the company, we knew all along that there could be an opportunity to, to have a, like a, basically a self-sterilizing, self-indicating face mask. Um, but we uh, didn't really have the resources to commit to something that, you know, would have such a maybe a long path to market through regulatory process. And so uh, we, we basically uh, worked with, you know, with NASA, there's a, a group out of the Air Force, AFWORKS, uh, National Science Foundation. You know, we ended up taking advantage of the PPP loan and uh, networked into the Navy. And we kind of took every avenue that we could. Um, we've got a couple of B2B uh, partners or B2B kind of discussions ongoing. Uh, but the, 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 the challenge, I guess, um, in the near term, and you know, I think this, there's a difference between what we look at, the, what we see for the long-term prospects, and once we go through a full regulatory process, what, what will be available to us. But unfortunately, with our particular product and the claims that we would be trying to make, we're kind of stuck in, a, um, in, a, in, in no man's land in, in some ways that the emergency use authorizations associated with masks don't cover the kind of claims that we would make with our product. And so um, we, we end up having to, um, you know, our, our product is basically too good to use as a general consumer product without regulatory support. And at the same time, since we don't have the regulatory support, we can't 
Um, we can't market the product uh, as, you know, basically as is. So it's been a kind of a tricky thing, but that, that in itself was a really good resource as well that saved us a lot, um, a lot of pain and heartache to basically fully ramp up production only to find out that, uh, that the regulatory path to, to, you know, legal, at least legal sale of our product uh, is, was a little bit more um, uh, far reaching than we had, we had originally hoped it would be. Mm -hmm. And did you pursue any of the federal funding, any of the, the, whether it's the rapid grants or any of those through the SBIR program or other CARES Act funding opportunities? Yeah, so the, when we get to our friends at Earth Sense, they'll probably address that. Yeah, so National Science Foundation, we did apply and still have our grant or our proposal under review. So uh, I don't know the end, ending of that one yet. And then the same thing with, uh, with AFWorks, you know, we ended up making it through uh, a couple rounds of like their, their initial cuts in terms of reviewing proposals. And so that still could have, you know, we haven't been told no yet, uh, but that might be a indefinite, uh, you know, an, an indefinite delay on any review there. So um, it's too early to tell in terms of where that's gonna go. Okay. So Michael, kind of along those lines, you mentioned, you alluded to the fact that, of course, prototyping, that's your specialty, is already happening. Uh, you wanna address how, how that came to be as well as maybe um, talk about the funding that EarthSense has received to support that work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let me uh, start with the funding to, to those. So um, we, you know, initially actually EarthSense was, um, besides venture capitalist funding and some of the things, we did get the uh, SBIR grant uh, phase one, um, I think like a year ago for the initial um, part of it. And um, we were actually really lucky enough to get the phase two grant um, this spring, which was a, you know, huge accomplishment on our part. Um, we appreciate you know, all the help we had with that. Um, that actually happened at a point when, you know, we were looking at doing more, you know, um, rounds of fundraising and, you know, that that grant was, um, or the SBIR grant was kind of in the process of being approved. Um, so we had this scary moment where we were like, it, you know, is this funding even gonna happen? Um, you know, and we, so luckily that kind of came through for us. Um, we did also, you know, apply for PPP loans, um, had some, you know, got approval for some of those. Um, and as well as I know that uh, we did, unfortunately, get it um, not approved for us. Um, what is it? C3AI Digital Transformation Institute, um, you know, request for funding, and that was another um, sanitizing robotic you know, proposal for that. So um, the SBIR grant has been a huge part, you know, of ours. And then um, you know we'll see. So this fall we're going to be doing another round of fundraising um, and going through and kind of showing the expansion of, you know, currently we you know only really produce a you know. Um, data collecting robot, and then we're venturing into all sorts of things of, you know, weeding, harvesting, seeding, all sorts of different functions and kind of expanding onto that. Um, so specific to the prototyping on that, um, one thing we try to push very heavy forward our company is, you know, it's basically fail early, is what we like to say, or at least what I like to say. And a lot of that is just very quickly trying to produce items, test them, validate them, see how things are working. Um, one of the big problems with the digital, or excuse me, the agriculture industry is that we have a very specific timeline. So, you know, we have the next, I guess, four months really to do as much prototyping and testing as we can on that. Um, luckily, we, you know, have a bunch of 3D printers, um, all sorts of other manufacturing tools. We're looking to expand on that as well. Um, so that was, I guess, one of the big challenges with COVID was we're used to all sitting in a room, sharing things, working together, you know, talking all the time, being there together. So that was kind of a big shift. Um, it's interesting, like actually currently my um, office in my house is full of 3D printers and I can't even go in there without like wearing a dust mask or a safety thing because it's so full of plastic fumes. Um, so that was just like one of the ways that, you know, I personally transitioned into that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, we found that, yeah, through some of these funding, um, what we found the kind of connection through and who we worked with was, um, through kind of the software connecting with the hardware. And so what I've done with her since is we went from, you know, four or five robots in the very beginning to try to ramp up production. So on um, this year, we have the scale to build about a hundred robots in this year if we needed to, um, but that'll kind of continue into next year, depending on you know, how the market and everything moves with that. Um, but sort of that challenge of, you know, we working with local manufacturers, some in Ogden, Illinois, um, produce some of the plastic parts, 
We also had some scares with um, one of our indie manufacturers was sending us uh, circuit boards that we had designed. And like three days before those final boards were supposed to ship is when India went on that total lockdown for the entire country. Um, so luckily because of, you know, agricultural research being part of the, um, you know, essential as well as the medical side of things too, we were able to kind of get a grant and get those or get an approval to get those sent out. But um, there's definitely been a lot of yeah, like pivoting and moving around and trying to adjust to a lot of those things. But um, we found that we're just kind of like relying on other sources. Some of our sources like completely disappeared and were closed for months. So we had to kind of shift and, uh, you know, getting physical products is, you know, a challenge with, you know, different countries closing down and you know, all that kind of lockdown happening. But so far we've been able to, you know, manage through that. The, the life of an entrepreneur is be nimble. Yep. I think that's the, uh, the lesson that we're hearing. But Bob, did you want to add to this uh, resources, partnerships? That... Oh, well, like the others, you know, we, we pursued a PPP grant right away because one of our biggest challenges in the, in the ag industry is it's, it's a really terrible economy right now for farmers. And, and what farmers tend to do is when things get tough, they quit spending money on anything that's not critical or they know is going to work. So uh, I'll be honest and say our sales are down this year and that put a strain on our, our cash flow for our company. And thankfully it worked pretty hard with a uh, local bank and you know, we weren't successful the first round, but we were successful the second round getting a PPP grant, which is not huge, but for us, it's definitely going to help us out with that. Um, and, and probably one of the biggest challenges I faced was, you know, as we got into early April, I was trying to figure out how to train my pilots and not be sitting next to them in an airplane. Um, it got to be real tricky because I had a couple of returning pilots, but three or four new ones. And I actually had to put them on a lockdown for a few weeks. And then by mid-April, um, they had all been self-isolating. And I took a little bit of a leap of faith. And I said, I, I cannot make you guys sit in an airplane together. But if you are willing to do that, it's your choice. And, and we can proceed and start getting you flying hours and, and training you. And uh, and they did. And I had just enough people that knew how to do this that I could have a train the trainer sort of thing, which was a little bit tricky. If it hadn't been for that, I'd have been really hard pressed to figure out how to get pilots in the air and show them how to fly the airplanes this year. As far as the, um, the using the infrared technology through those cameras, have you pursued any uh, uh, sounds like the system is already a go, so it's an, it, or is it still in the prototype phase? And what is no, that? it's it, it's a go. It's a production. You know, frankly, Laura, it's really more of a me getting out and marketing and talking to people and, and seeing what the interest is in it right now. And and as I said, and you know, like EarthSense, you know, we're in the farm world right now, and it's really busy out there. Um, and and it's just a matter of getting some time carved out. And I'm I'm hopeful now that things are settling down that in the next week or so I can do that. Um, I, I think that there's maybe been a little bit of a lull in the, the sense of urgency of this, given the other things going on in the world right now that's, that's taken a lot of the news cycles. But I, I fear that, especially where we are, as we get back into August, September, and October, there could be a resurgence of this, and, and having this temperature monitoring thing could be really helpful for a lot of businesses or institutions, and, and hopefully we can ride that wave a little bit. Uh, so I, I do want to mention to those who are watching right now, we, we do welcome your questions if you want to put them in the chat. Um, Kathy MacArthur will be mo is monitoring that and she will be uh, feeding the questions to our panelists um, in a few minutes, but we do have just a couple more questions um, moving forward. Just uh, we have talked about sort of, you know, what are what are some of the lessons that you've learned through this process, and uh, and I think we've we've alluded to that, but I'm just going to ask it more directly and see if there's anything you wanted to add um, specifically uh, lessons from from um, that might be applicable to those who are watching, especially as they think about their own technologies and maybe if there's a way to pivot, whether it's related to COVID or something else. So I'm going to send that out to Mike first. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, um, you know, being a small company, you know, we're around like 10 employees, give or take some, you know, with interns and things. Um, the kind of need for, I guess, management um, or kind of overseeing some things, um, you know, having 10 people in a room being able to solve problems really quickly um, is a very nice thing to be able to do. And with, you know, COVID, that kind of got in the way of things. 
Um, so I think that having sort of, you know, overseers or people that are helping kind of guide that process um, can be very, very helpful in this. And that's sort of one of the things we're pivoting. We actually have, um, I'll show you space in the name, but we have somebody that's actually working in India currently with us that wakes up at, you know, or like works at like 10 p.m. So we can have a, you know, 10 a.m. meeting here um, kind of thing. So it's just sort of like that kind of leadership, you know, really helped us um, kind of get over the hump and get through things. Because I think that was sort of a, um, when you're small and as you're building up to a certain level, you kind of need guides, I think, for it. So not necessarily experts in these specific areas, but people that can kind of guide you through the entire process for it. So that was sort of one of the things that I saw was like the biggest need that we were able to kind of fill and that hit us pretty, you know, pretty hard on that. So, yeah. Um, Bob, any lessons learned through? Uh... Yeah, you know, the thing that jumps out to me, Laura, is, is that uh, when they started talking about the CARES Act and stuff, I was maybe just a tiny bit slow on the reaction to that and didn't realize how fast you had to move. And, and there was a lot of documentation that had to get put together for that pretty quickly. And in our case, you know, because we're seasonal, you know, we were able to do the seasonal thing. And, you know, sometimes like, well, do I really want to take this government money or not? But I realize now that's just dumb. If it's there, you got to jump on it because otherwise you're at a competitive disadvantage to everybody else. So I think if, if there's resources that look like they're going to be coming, I think it's incumbent on all of us to research them as much as you can, be ready so that when something is opened up, just jump on it immediately. That, that was a lesson I learned. Along those lines, I know we sent out some information today. The idle loans, the economic injury disaster loans have reopened um, by the SBA, as well as there is still uh, resources available in the PPP program, although that's about to ex um, expire soon. So um, for those of you who are in that position or watching this in a timely manner, uh, understand that there are those things out there as well, um, as well as federal funding opportunities that we keep seeing for entrepreneurs, especially deep tech entrepreneurs. And we try to keep abreast of those as much as possible, whether they are SBIR related or otherwise. Um, we are also working on several grant opportunities that, so that we can provide more resources to our entrepreneurs through Enterprise Works, whether you're a tenant of Enterprise Works or not, um, and are, are, are working on these projects. So um, expect more information about that as in the, in the weeks ahead, so in months ahead, because this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So Jim, how about some lessons learned by you? And I notice, are you wearing one of your, uh, one of the masks with one of your filters now? Yeah, I figured that I gotta have a prop, uh... <laughs> you know, I should have been wearing it earlier, but uh, yeah, so this is a mask. This is a prototype that uh, we had. We had actually worked, um, <clears throat> most of the prototyping was with uh, the Magic Needle in, over in, in Urbana uh, near downtown. Uh, uh, she, Beth there, was able to help us make about 20, 30 masks, and we've been testing those. This one actually came from a government, um, a B2G contractor out in Los Angeles. And I think one of the things, I don't, I don't know if it's a, a lesson I've fully learned yet, and I could get really cynical here when it goes to lessons learned, uh, but you know, in terms of understanding the limitations uh, you know, as a company, even if, even if you've got something that could be valuable, making sure that your supply chain is incentivized to prioritize you and, um, and right now, I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that we faced in terms of getting our product ready to market is, um, is delays through all the supply chain partnerships where it would be a really big deal for us to sell, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 masks. But to someone who's making millions of masks, it's really, really a challenge for them to, you know, even if the unit economics are really solid. And so that, that's been a little bit of a challenge for us. Um, but I think in terms of one of the things I've really taken, taken uh, to heart is right from the beginning, I think one of, the, one of the things that we acknowledged is one of the risks in making this, uh, how we were gonna mitigate the, the risks, knowing that you know, this is an effort, we didn't know what the endpoint was gonna look like. And um, I, I knew from a uh, product development perspective that all the effort that I put into making this mask, at least in terms of the, the filter part of it, the insert that goes in here, is all things that are gonna pay dividends down the road in terms of supply chain development, technology development, all things that you know, basically can add to our, um, 
our, you know, I guess our IP portfolio, our, our capabilities down the road. And so when we go to build air purifier or automotive cabin air filter, or even a next generation um, HVAC filter, that the things that we learned building this are all going to translate. And so I, I figured that that was uh, the worst outcome I could have is that the mask never sells. And instead I've got, you know, I've, I've rapidly accelerated our product development. Um, and, and, you know, it looks like that's still a possibility of where it could end up. Um, and then I think the other, the other challenge, I guess, um, I've learned is, is back to the supply chain is it's not just about money um, and not just about, uh, you know, it, it, there's also a, a really, you know, incredibly important element of, having influence and, and control over our ability to kind of control our own destiny. And that was really part of what birthed our launch into direct to consumer is knowing that we had consume, you know, latent consumer demand. Um, we wanted to be able to fill it. And now what we're realizing is as demand is increasing, we're putting pressure on our supply chain that, you know, we could potentially alleviate by holding on to more of the production ourselves. So, Though we kind of started as purely an R&D operation, you know, we pivoted into marketing and now we're getting into operations and now, you know, eventually we're going to get into production. So we're going to have the, the whole deal going here, but um, it's a, a lesson I'm continuing to learn. I put it that way. Well, I think you just kind of answered my last question before we go to Q&A, which is um, what is the way forward for your company? So I'll, I'll, I, I'll give you a pass, Jim, since you already prefaced that and, and head to you, Bob. Um, is, you, know, you mentioned before that this is, a, is still a very busy time for you and this is height of season. And so this might just be some, an add-on for your company, but you know, um, maybe there's a, potential for uh, diversification of your tools moving forward well beyond COVID. So interested to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, the, the company that makes the cameras is, is, you know, well ahead of where we are in terms of marketing this. And, and, you know, their argument is, as they're trying to pitch this, is this is something that we can look at long term to promote healthier workplace environments or school environments. I mean, if think about how many times kids probably walk into high school with a fever because they didn't want to miss and they really shouldn't be there. You know, if you could literally catch illnesses a lot more frequently before people showed up in a workplace or the, the gym to work out or, or whatnot, um, I think it's going to really be an interesting, um, whether it's accepted or not, I guess, you know, whether companies or institutions will accept this or whether people will accept this, you know, the idea that I walk in and I get a yellow light because I'm at 99.4 today and somebody says, you can't come to work. Well, okay, how, do, how does that work out? You know, there's a lot more than just simply making a temperature measurement. I mean, we can do that extremely accurately, but it's more the cultural side that I'm, I'll be curious to see how it develops. But in the, in the near term, the next say, six months to a year, uh, you know, my, my hope is that we can have some influence locally in say Champaign County area with businesses, institutions with this and promote healthier workplaces and frankly let places open up a little bit more comfortably if they know they've got a way to screen people with fevers coming in but it's a bit of an unknown and, and as you alluded to Laura I'm, we're all pretty busy but I think I'm getting a few cycles freed up now that I'm going to start spending more time on this. Well maybe there's some way you can combine this with uh, with with the with the air airline industry too so healthy yeah, exactly. healthy uh, healthy pl planes and things like that. So yeah, yeah. Some, some of your expertise, I noticed that you came dressed appropriately today, by the way, I just <laughs> want to give a shout out to your shirt. So, um, so yeah, how about you, Mike? Yeah, so um, I guess the future of Earth Sense is, um, is nice. And so there's an entire group at the university that um, this year started an autonomous farm. So it's a whole group of um, people from out the university that are kind of getting together to try out different sensors and functionality. Um, so I guess, yes, yeah, Southwest Urbana, um, or excuse me, Southeast Urbana, there's a you know, plot of you know, corn that's being grown out there as well as we've got some like cherry tomato and strawberry plants and a few things. And the goal is to try to run as autonomous of a farm as we possibly can. So again, we're doing prototypes of weeding devices, you know, seeding, all sorts of things to kind of fill in these uh, kind of like user needs. And so, you know, initially we're, you know, this year we're trying to validate um, just the concept itself. So it's kind of very low scale. And as we move forward, we're gonna be trying to get into new areas. So um, one of the things we already knew with agriculture that, you know, we built this platform of the TerraCentia robot that we have now that we're sending out. 
And now we're kind of applying that technology to you know other applications. So, you know, areas where we had trouble like navigating in the dirt, we've kind of solved some of those problems and now we're going to apply that to other areas. So um, we kind of already in the move of, you know, expanding out our market and everything that we have as much as possible to it. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice. We, we don't know exactly where that's going to all end up. Um, you know, we're trying a bunch of different products. Um, even just getting into the healthcare and doing the UV light is a whole new realm for us. Um, so we're kind of excited to explore that area. And so it's kind of nice that we have a lot of technology that overlaps. So, you know, like I said, the robotic arm, the transportation device, you know, visual navigation of complex spaces, all of those things. So it's not like a huge departure from us to kind of do some of this new tech, um, but it's, you know, fun little areas to explore to kind of build on to what we already have. So, you know, we're, all, we're always looking for, you know, more ways that we can use our tech to, um, you know, break into new areas. I actually had my old boss from when I was in the nuclear industry um, call me up and, you know, we were in small little talks about how we could, you know, put some of our robots into a nuclear power plant. So just those little types of things are, you know, fun to explore and then even more fun to you know, try to actually try out on that. So, yeah. Well, I am going, I don't see any questions right now in the chat. I'm going to turn it over. Unfortunately, I have to slip out to another event, but Kathy is going to run our Q&A. So thanks to our panelists and, um, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, if you guys have any other comments that you wanted to add, feel free to do so now. Thanks, Laura. I actually had one question and maybe uh, Jim can address this. You had mentioned or touched briefly about incentivizing your vendors in the supply chain. Um, do you have additional advice or can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, I think it's about finding people who are, you know, for, for us, it's been about finding people who are willing to look at the long term. And, um, you know, and when you're giving them a purchase order for, you know, 10,000 parts of something, they have to see the path for where it's going to get to hundreds of thousands or millions. And, and I think that um, it's been, it's been illuminating, I guess, to go through the experience when like when things get tight, who stands by you and who kind of just, you know, drops to the curb. And I think that that's information we'll be able to take with us going forward and knowing, you know, who, you know, who has, who's helped. And we, we've been able to maybe weed out some suppliers that um, aren't as willing to look to the long term. And um, yeah, so beyond that, I don't know, you know, I think that there's, there's elements of, you know, just, you know, risk, risk tolerance as well. Um, and, um, and, and I can appreciate from their perspective, a lot of times that, it can seem like a nuisance, but I think it's really about, you know, finding people who are willing to, to look to the long term. So it's kind of shifted the focus to like preemptively develop and build those relationships with those vendors. When you can, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, when, instead of when you're scrambling because you lost a supplier or because the supplier yeah. is two sure. months backed up, then, you know, it doesn't leave a lot of time for relationship building. Yeah. Um, but... Um, but yeah, usually, you know, it, 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 we've been able to work it out this far. Good job. Does anybody else have any other questions? Let's see if I, can... I don't see any in the chat. Laura, did you have any other comments? Laura Burks? just wanted to thank everyone for sharing your stories. It's incredibly um, exciting to see the ability that you've had to respond to this and your perseverance and also just the successes you've had as entrepreneurs overall. We couldn't be prouder to have you as part of our community and we're grateful to see that you're working with other local small businesses as well to make these technologies possible. So I'd really like to thank Jim, Bob, Michael for participating today and sharing your experiences. Um, we'll continue to have more brown bag discussions, one coming up in August with Gerald Wilson from Autonomic Materials Inc. is another great example of an Enterprise Works graduate in our community and their success building uh, coatings technology. So please join us for future sessions and thank you everybody for sharing your stories today. Yeah, and we will make a uh, recording available to everyone that attended as well. So if you have any feedback, feel free to let me know. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Today. All right. Thank Thanks you so much. Okay, bye-bye.